Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sovereign Way. If you are out in the courtyard, please make your way on in at this time, out in the foyer, out in the hallway. I'm not sure if we're streaming. We were having some issues. Um, it doesn't look like we are, all right? But if you happen to be online watching this later and you're wondering why this wasn't up, it looks like there's some internet service problems going on across our city. But the rest of you, welcome, good morning. We are glad that you are here. And if you're thinking that there's going to be an option in the overflow room, that won't be uh, going on as well, too. Just the courtyard TV, okay, just to kind of give you a heads up. So make your way on in, everybody. We're going to begin to praise the Lord this morning. Our first song this morning we'll be singing is the new doxology. Please stand to your feet. Let us enter into the presence of God with thanksgiving and with praise. This is one of the oldest Christian songs uh, known to Christianity, and so let us praise him this morning.
praise to our Lord this morning. Let's praise our good and wonderful God. As we sing this next song, let us admit our need and confess our need to the Lord, uh, for we need him every hour. We are weak. He is strong. We are sinners. He is holy and righteous. He is our he is our righteousness, as this song uh, declares, the one defense that we have when we stand before God. Let's come to him now. Admit your need before the Lord. Confess our sin. That is 
why we need our Savior. He's our one defense and our righteousness. Sing, Lord, I need you with all your might. Lord, I stand before God on that day when he comes again. That will be our only plea. We will not be able to say, God, look how nice I was to everybody because we have been sinners. We will not be able to say, God, I went to work and I was on time every day and I paid my taxes. That will not be our defense. It will not be a lot of people liked me. All right. I was faithful to my wife because we will still have sin to account for. But on that day when we stand before the Lord, Jesus will declare us not guilty because he paid our debt. Amen? He paid our debt. He is our righteousness, our one defense. And while we have no sin, we still need righteousness to enter into the presence of God. And that's where Jesus comes in once again. Not only does he pay our debt, but he gives us his righteousness so that we may stand before God. What a blessed day that will be. And we stand before him now, church. Let us sing this next song in celebration of what God has done. This song is called, Did You Feel the Mountains Tremble? And this imagery of this song, if you're paying attention to it, you, you will recognize, as we spoke on the day of the Lord last week from the book of Joel, it is a day of trembling for those who do not know the Lord. It is a day when things will be darkened, as we'll learn today, when the sun will grow dark, when the moon will grow dark. It is a day when the judgment of God comes. And so darkness and evil will tremble in fear when the Lord comes. But for those of us who know the Lord, it is a day of rejoicing. And so as we sing this song, you will recognize both of those themes coming together in this song. That God can break a nation and God can save a nation. And so this song really, um, if you're not aware, this song deals with the day of the Lord and when Christ comes again. So let us rejoice in this while at the same time we are aware that there's those who will, this will not be a good day for. Did you feel the mountains tremble?
his footstool. As Malachi says, we will act like bounding calves, leaping and dancing. Is it true that God can break a nation? church. Amen. Please greet each other. Friends, visitors, guests, we are glad that you are here with us this morning. Grace and peace to you. Please greet each other with grace and peace.
sisters, let us sing Ancient of Days. There's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Everyone will bow. That day is coming. There will no one be exalted. seated. Our God is worthy of all praise and singing and adoration. He is the beloved Savior that we need so much. I can't wait to experience that day when every being, every being that has intelligence, all angels, all principalities, demons, unbelievers and believers will just fall before the Lord and confess that Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is God. We look forward to that day. We're going to sing another song, but we'll be taking our offering this morning as we do that. So ushers, if you will please help out with that. Um, they'll pass the baskets around. And if you prefer to give online, you can do so. But just know that um, when you give at Sovereign Way, you are giving not so that we can build monuments to ourselves or our own church, but we are building a monument to Christ, meaning we are trying to build a kingdom. We are trying to call more sinners to repentance and faith in Christ. And so we want to support those who train um, us to be gospel witness uh, witnesses in this world, but also we want to support missionaries. Uh, we want to help start other churches. Those are the kinds of things that we can expect our giving to go to. Of course, we do help the needy as well, too. We want to show the love of God, um, not just spread the gospel. We want to demonstrate that God is a giving God, and he gave his son to us that we might be saved. And so uh, the one of the ways that we do that is through our helping of those who are in need. So please uh, give as God has blessed you. Give joyfully, cheerfully as we sing how great thou art. I know this is uh, 
a very popular hymn. It's uh, less than 100 years old, I believe, but still um, one that most of us know. And uh, the last verse is, When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation, there will be an announcement that heralds Christ in. And all these songs that we are singing this morning, are you're going to see how they tie in to our sermon this morning as we look at Joel chapter 2. But for now, let's sing how great thou art and just know that Christ is coming again. There will be a trumpet announcement as our king comes into this world. How great thou art. Take me home, joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble
to each other and remind us of the truth of Scripture. Because you are great. How great. How great you are. You are great. Because you are great. Come, Lord Jesus. Our brother Carlos is going to come and lead us in the, uh, the next part of our service where we corporately pray to the one who is great. That is why we pray, church. We cannot do anything apart from the sustaining life that God gives us and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that made it to our prayer meeting this morning, thank you so much for praying for us already. We are glad that God is here with us. Amen. Good morning. How you feeling? Good. Can you address the elephant in the room? You don't have a beard anymore. I have a beard. It's not as long. Okay, as we were. <laughs> we'll talk afterwards in the alley. <laughs> as we were saying, good morning. Thank you for coming, brothers and sisters, and uh, any visitors. Thanks for coming, and uh, we uh, greet you, and we'd love to talk to you in the back. I have a few announcements. Uh, the first one is uh, the men's breakfast is happening this Saturday, the 19th, at uh, 9 a.m. here. So if you can make it, and if you're a man, then show up, please. So we love to see you here. And also, if you have your bulletins, please keep those on hand. There's a lot of things that are going on throughout the week, Bible studies, gathering, the student ministry. So keep a look at that. Um, if you're not involved in a group, it's a good idea to get involved. Uh, consider joining one if you're not involved in one because you're not created to be a lone warrior. Uh, that's a false Hollywood idea that the true man is the one who's always alone. In fact, if you're alone, it's a b bigger chance for you to sin and to mess up and to be taken captive by the devil. So join because your sanctification, you become more like Jesus when you're surrounded in community. It also protects you from the canyon of heresies so that you don't go and say, hey, I got an idea. You start going down this path and you mess up and then all of a sudden you've created the new Arianism or something. So, uh, you know, thinking of that, I mean, if you go to uh, Pastor Steve's class on church history or listen to um, Brian teaching uh, the, the theology of the church and the, and the, and the fathers, I mean, you can actually see what's going on so you can not go into the uh, errors that we have seen in the past. So you'll become equipped, you'll become challenged, and you can come and learn. And if you're one of those who says, oh, nobody talks to me, well, if the mountain doesn't come to you, then you go to the mountain. We're supposed to be in community together. So again, keep those bulletins because you'll see things that are happening there. Uh, as well, uh, the Israeli trip is happening for 2025 in 2025, not now, but go to the back and make sure you sign up if you have any questions. Again, you're not mandated or obligated to go. It's just so that we can get a head count. If you're interested, you can find out more information about that. And last week, our brother gave us some information about gospel tracks and the idea of having one. If you tend to be a person who's not easy to, you find it difficult to talk to people, this is a good way to kind of begin a conversation. Um, in fact, it actually opens up a way, and then sometimes you might plant a seed, sometimes you put a rock in their shoe to make them think, but if you leave this, it'll make them think, hopefully, and so that's a way to get somebody to initiate with you. Uh, so these are the gospel tracks. They're also found on the foyer in the back. And I think uh, lastly, oh no, not lastly, we also have next Sunday after church, we have the nursing ministry meeting. All those people during the members meeting that volunteered or rose your hand, raised your hand to volunteer, Please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, stay for that meeting after church next Sunday. Any questions, address them to Pastor Josh. He'd be happy to help you uh, for those who want to volunteer for that. And lastly, um, I'm going to bore you and drill you with this. Um, I'm going to tell you again about the Reasonable Truth Conference uh, where um, 
We'll be dealing with multiple issues. I think last week uh, we talked about the issue of abortion and how we're having a speaker talk about that. Um, there was another image there too, but the other idea is going to be concerning AI, artificial intelligence. And so the question is, what is the Christian response to artificial intelligence? Should we be afraid? Is this going to be the terminator? Is it going to cause uh, non-sentient ideas? issues, things, computers to gain consciousness and take over the world and basically bring in the apocalypse. That's one way to look at it. There's extreme ways of doing this, but should we be apprehensive about this? Should we be appreciative of the technology and use it for the glory of God? And then how can we really respond to what's coming our way? As well as gene editing. Have you guys heard of CRISPR technology? So it's the idea of editing systems. We all, viruses have this capacity, we're doing it now, and it's not FDA approved, but it's a way to potentially try to get rid of cancer and certain type of diseases, go to the genome and cut it and splice it, essentially. Your body can do that, nature does that, but can you do it? So should we be involved in this kind of technology and what are the ramifications? You can have, um, order your own babies and order them if they're Mexican and have blue eyes like me. They don't normally come out like that, but you can actually do stuff like that. But what are the ramifications of that when you start playing God? And so those are some things that we're going to talk about. I won't go too much more into that. But again, uh, if you can sign up for that, we have uh, flyers in the back. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. It's a theology apologetics conference to help you engage your culture for Christ. And so, yes. Yeah, and if you need it, the QR code is there. It's also in the flyer in the back, and then I have one on my phone too. And so now we're going to move on to our tradition, kind of our um, custom that we have here at uh, Sunrise. Sunrise, oh my goodness, I'm tripping like a villain on penicillin today. <laughs> I, saw, I was looking at Linda, and I started thinking at Sovereign Way. <laughs> Man, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Tom, where's Thomas? I'm disqualified. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Unreached People Group, let the sun rise on us. <laughs> the Lord, thank you for that. Okay, so the people group we're going to be dealing with today is the, they call them the Sikh Walkimi. It starts with a V, but they pronounce it W. The Sikh Walkimi in India, their total population is 291,000. This particular group is interesting because I know some Sikhs. Uh, if you steal from them, they hit you with a paddle, so don't do that. Stealing is wrong. But I talked to one of my friends who's a doctor, and I asked him about this. And, and so not all Sikhs are Walkimi. Walkimi is a particularly interesting breed. That's why there's 20, 2, 000, uh, 291,000. They're a particular caste of Hinduism. But what they did is they actually absorbed Sikhism into their belief system. So Sikhism generally is monotheistic. You hear about... Judaism, Christianity, Islam being the monotheistic faiths. Well, Sikhism tends to have some monotheistic notions too. But when you mix the Walkimi caste with the Sikhism, you have a syncretism or a merging of these ideas. So they adopted it. So they're not purely Sikhs in that sense. So some of them believe in one God, some of them believe in a plurality of gods. But they also believe in reincarnation. And so that explains that they're originated from Hinduism. That they did emerge out of Hinduism during the time of the European Protestant Reformations. And then during the Indian Re Re Rebellion in 1857, they were prominently freedom fighters. So they were enlisted to fight. Um, their founder said this, which I thought was interesting. He said, truth is the highest virtue, but higher still is living truth or truthful living. Truth is the highest virtue, but higher still is truthful living. So it's interesting that many ideologies have pieces of the truth, but it's still lacking and missing. And so let us begin our prayer for these people and then for the, for the rest of the passage, uh, the sermon. Um, but let's consider John chapter 14, verses 4 through 6, to hear what Jesus talks about truth and how we can use that as a springboard for praying for these people and then for anybody who's lost. John 14, verse 4 says, And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Lord, we come before you. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for granting us just life one more day, Lord, to be able to experience your love, your presence, to be able to come together, Lord, and join, to be able to sing praises to you, Lord, to sing how great you are, 
to sing of your amazing riches, Lord, that there is nowhere in the world that there is salvation found except for you. And as Jesus told us here that he is the way, there is no other way. You've created us for yourself, and we're restless until we find our rest in you. You've made us to worship, and when we don't worship you, we'll worship anything else. And so we see that this spirit of deception comes and deceives the people, Lord, to believe that there's many ways to you, Lord. But Jesus has told us that there is only one way, one way to truth, one way to life, one way to the Father. And so, Lord, we pray for the Walkimi people. We pray for anybody else as well that doesn't know you, that they would come to realize their sinfulness, that they are restless because they don't know you, and that if they would just heed and listen to what you say, that you are the way, that because you are the way, you are the truth, not just truth propositionally, but truth incarnate, truth in the flesh, and that you've come to give us the truth, but to show us how to live, and that apart from you, there is no life, that you are the only way to the Father, and that you've made a way, and that we can approach you with confidence. So Lord, we pray for this, we pray that you would send people, Lord, to the Walkimi. We pray that your Holy Spirit would open their eyes, would change their hearts, the Spirit being the giver of life, that it would give them life, that they would come to you, Lord, to know the true God, the only God, above all else. We also pray for Pastor Josh, Lord. We pray that you would fill him with your Spirit, that the word that he brings uh, would not just uh, challenge us and equip us and convict us, but remind us of how good you are and that you are a God of justice, but you're a God of mercy, that he would glorify you, Lord, and that you would bless him, Lord, to preach your word, Lord, and that anybody here who would hear, that they would hear and do what you've called us to do, that they would think about everything that we think about today and that your spirit would open it up in our hearts and that we would be submissive and obey because in obeying you, Lord, we find freedom and we are truly blessed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Good morning once again, church. If you would, take your Bibles and open them to the minor prophecy of Joel, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11 this morning. Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And once you found your place in Scripture, please stand to your feet as we read God's Word this morning. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The Lord says this through the prophet Joel. Blow the ram's horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and total darkness, like the dawn spreading over the mountains. A great and strong people appears, such as has never existed in ages past and never will again in all the generations to come. A fire devours in front of them, and behind them a flame blazes. The land in front of them is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them it is like a desert wasteland. There is no escape from them. Their appearance is like that of horses, and they gallop like war horses. They bound on the tops of mountains. Their sound is like the sound of chariots, like the sound of fiery flames consuming stubble, like a mighty army deployed for war. Nations writhe in horror before them. All faces turn pale. They attack as warriors. They scale walls as men of war do. Each goes on his own path, and they do not change their course. They do not push each other. Each proceeds on his own path. They dodge the arrows, never stopping. They storm the city. They run the wall. They climb into houses. They enter through the windows like thieves. The earth quakes before them. The sky shakes. The sun and moon go dark, and the stars cease their shining. The Lord makes his voice heard in the presence of his army. 
His camp is very large. Those who carry out his command are powerful. Indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible and dreadful. Who can endure it? Let us pray. Lord, your word here concerning the day of the Lord is mighty and strong. And it lets us know of what Judah was to face, what they were facing, Lord. And it is a reminder that there is a day coming when Christ will descend upon this world, not just in salvation to save his church, but he will descend in judgment. And people apart from Christ, without the Savior, will not be able to endure that day. They will flee and find no refuge. They will scream and no one will come to their help. Lord, that day is coming. And so I pray that you would alert us and wake us all up to the majesty and to the terror of that day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, brothers and sisters and visitors and friends. The sermon is titled, Humanity's Horror, the Terror of Judah. This is the Day of the Lord, Part 2. Last year, I went on a short cruise to Catalina with my wife, and it was a great trip. <clears throat> During our time on the island, I decided to go disc golfing in the morning. And Jenny came along with me, and we took a nice little hike to a, well, I thought it was nice. There was some <laughs> tough stuff there. Nice little hike to a secluded mountainside where there was a disc golf course. It's on a mountainside. If you don't know what disc golf is, uh, I forgive you, all right? It's, it's like golf, but better, okay? Instead of clubs and golf balls and being, being very expensive, you just throw discs around into baskets, and it's a fairly cheap hobby and, and sport to participate. On hole number three of this disc golf course, I threw the disc, and it went out of bounds on the side of a mountain. I went over to see where my disc was, and I saw that it was down a slope about 35 to 40 feet. Nothing too hard to get back and up down. Not that far. No big deal. So I shimmy down the mountainside. I grab my disc. I toss it back up to the top of the mountainside. And as I threw it, I'm standing on a bunch of eucalyptus leaves, and they begin to slide. And I'm sliding with them, moving down the mountainside. I was unable to get solid footing as I tried to make my way back up the mountainside. I tried as best as I could, and I found myself sliding foot by foot more and more down the hill. And my heart began to race because the hillside dropped off. It was like a straight drop off after about another 100 feet. And so I knew if I started to slide and momentum gained, I knew I would not be able to stop. And just another 30 feet from where I was was a cactus patch of all things. So I knew that if I slid to my death... I was going to blast through this wicked cactus patch on the way down. At the base of the mountain, there was a regular golf course, and a golfer had stopped in a cart to see what was going on with me. And he, he could tell that I was in a bit of a pinch. Okay? I don't know if you know what eucalyptus leaves are like, but they're sturdy, they're slippery, and this hillside was just covered with them. And so I had no way to gain any traction. And he sh shouted up at me, are you okay? And in my pride, I shouted, I think so. That's the best I could muster up. He could tell I was in trouble. But in my, in my heart, I kept thinking, this is how people die. I'm not exaggerating. I can't believe this is how I am going to die. That's literally what went through my mind. This is how I die. I did not see a way out of this. My wife was sitting on a bench in hole one, and she's enjoying a view of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Between two mountains, just looking down this valley, just beautiful, and I'm enjoying a different kind of view. <laughs> down a mountain and hard ground, and I am certain that this is not going to work out. Now, I know some of you are wondering, well, did you make it out? I'm just going to keep you in suspense a little longer, okay? I'll, I'll tell you what happened, okay? Now, briefly, I prayed, God, please get me out of this. That was all I said. And then I got really calm. I began to analyze the situation. I had nothing to grab onto. 
And as I was sliding further down the hill with each movement, I just decided not to move and get my center of gravity low and just spread out the weight, okay? Um, and uh, I moved some leaves around with my hand, and there was a tree root there, and I couldn't grab onto it because it was almost all the way buried except for the top part that was exposed. And so I, my heart's panicking, and I'm like, just don't move fast. Just calm down. And I start to scrape away dirt from the root and just pull the dirt away until there's enough dirt away that I can secure my hand onto that root. And then a little fear went away. I'm not out of it yet, but I just know if my feet slide, I at least have something to hold onto for the time being. And it'll procrastinate my death another 15 seconds because I, I don't think I can carry my own weight. But I'm holding onto it, and then I take one foot and I try to push leaves out of the way so that I can be standing on dirt and not leaves. And I got a foot secure. And then I did the thing, same thing with the other foot, pushing the leaves away. I got three points of nice, solid contact. I'm not sliding anymore. Then I take my hand, I move leaves around. There's another root. Do the same thing. Okay, now I got four solid points. Now I'm going to bring a foot up, move leaves around, get on solid ground. I'm, I'm hanging on to three points at all time. If you know how to climb uh, telephone poles, which I don't, but I know that you're supposed to keep three points of contact at all time for safety. And I just use that strategy. Get all four points secure, then move one. Then get that point secure, then move another one. And always have three points of contact. And I finally shimmied my way up the mountain, exhausted. I had cramps in my legs the next day from trying to rescue my own life. At that point, I looked back down at the guy, and I said, thank you, and I waved him on, and he probably thought, what an idiot <laughs> for a disc. Right? I had no idea that that was going to happen. I found my wife, and I told her that I almost died. And she said, Josh Ritchie. <laughs> That's, what she That's what she told me. Not, I'm so glad you're alive. <laughs> All right? I knew I was in trouble with her, too. <laughs> after just having a horrible moment of terror. I kid you not, I thought I was going to die. That, that was, a, it was a freaky uh, experience. In looking at the minor prophecy of Joel, we see a moment of terror, a moment of horror upon Judah. Is it is right, is it, it's right around the corner for them. Death is upon them. I'm going to recap what we've been talking about in Joel chapter 1 so that you can see what today's passage has to do with what we're talking about. What's going on in Joel? Joel is calling Judah to wake up, to wake up from their spiritual slumber. Devastation like no other has come upon their land in the form of a locust invasion. They, sh they should be weeping and wailing because they have no grain, they have no grapes, their, their food source has been depleted, and they need to consider the reason for this devastation upon their land because it wasn't just their food source that was affected. Yes, that was that. But they could not take that food and offer it to God in the worship rituals that God required of them. Their thank offerings. They were to give grain offerings out of appreciation to God for what he has done for them. And drink offerings or libations to God in his temple as they brought them before the priests. And if they were, if they were not torpid, if they were not spiritually slumbering, and rather if they were paying attention and alert... They would recognize that God had brought devastation upon the land as an act of judgment. It was God who stopped their offerings. It was God who stopped their food because they had broken covenant with God. So they could bring no thank offerings to God because God took away their blessing. He took away their joy. Why? What did they do that was wrong? We don't know. But we do know that according to the Mosaic covenant, that whenever they were unfaithful to God, that he would cause this land of rich blessing to be a land of total devastation. That's what God would do. Just like when God cursed the land when Adam and Eve sinned and kicked them out of the garden, so too at times God would curse the promised land and kick them out, reminding them that you cannot be with God if you are in sinful relationship with him. And so we can be certain that Judah broke co covenant or contract with God in some way. Again, that covenant being the Mosaic or the Sinaitic covenant, which God gave at Mount Sinai, if you remember, God gave it to them after God used Moses to free them, free the Israelites from slavery from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And they're out in the wilderness, and that's where God gives this contract, this covenant. Okay? And so in light of all the devastation, every citizen from old to young, from prophet to priest to people, they were all to cry out to the Lord as they assembled at the temple of God. And they were to plead for mercy and grace. They were to come to God in repentance and cry out 
for restorative favor. That was Joel 1 through 4, uh, 1 through 14. Last week, we looked at verses 15 through 20, and we began to see that this whole book is really centered around the day of the Lord, a day of visitation from God and judgment, okay? And so uh, we looked at the central theme of the book. We began to see that Joel warns about a near danger that is coming, a certain danger, a devastating day from God. But right, what's interesting is right after he says this day is coming, he begins to refer to past events, things that have already happened. And so what is up with that? Why? The reason being that he talks about the day of the Lord that's coming and then automatically starts talking about the past is because they're actually already in the middle of this day and its events. All their food sources have been ravished by locusts. The storehouses and the granaries where they normally store food, they're empty and broken down. The animals are moaning and groaning in hunger. There is no pasture. Joel the prophet, he's crying out to God because a drought has also hit their land and perhaps a fire, causing everything to dry up from streams to trees to seeds in the ground. It, it, it looks like fire hit them. All right, even if it, the drought is uh, symbolically mentioned in fire. So Joel is basically saying this, watch out for that day. It's coming. Well, how do you know, Joel? Because we're in it. Look at what's happening to us and what has happened. Look at the devastation upon us. We're experiencing the beginning of it already. And so that's why he speaks of this near event in, with past events. Okay, It's already upon them. Now, When it comes to the day of the Lord, and we spent a lot of time talking about this last week, because it's the central theme of the book, we want to make sure that you understand this day better so that when we come to more passages about it, you have more knowledge to stand on, right? So that it doesn't require so much explanation. So let me just recap a little bit of that. When it comes to the day of the Lord, we saw that this term, it is more than a one-time, end-time event. It is often used to refer to the day when Jesus comes back and judges sinners. And that is the day of the Lord. But many of us, we know that that's the only perspective that we were taught about this day, this event. And so we saw, and we looked at a ton of scriptures last week, we saw that it referred to a time in past also when God judged Israel by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, and even by the Romans. Those were days of the Lord. Okay, separate occasions where God judged Israel for their sin. In the case of the Romans, he used them to sack Jerusalem, to destroy the second temple, because they rejected Jesus Christ, just as Jesus foretold. But we also saw that the day of the Lord wasn't just about punishment for Israel. We saw that the day of the Lord was also a day where God would oftentimes rescue Israel, and he would punish Israel. Israel's enemies for their sins against them. He did this to Egypt, and he did this to Edom. We saw that the day of the Lord also, in another sense, referred to when Christ would come and visit the second temple. All right? He would come and bring salvation and judgment to Israel. And then we looked again, and we saw that there is a final day when Christ will come again. He will restore creation. He will save the church. He will judge the world. And so we gave a helpful definition to help understand this day, and we'll put it up on the screen right now. And we saw that the day of the Lord is a recurring event that has its final fulfillment in the return of Jesus Christ as he exalts himself, restores creation, finalizes our salvation, and judges unbelievers. Does that help you understand this? It's an event rather than just a a one-time day. Okay, The day of the Lord is a recurring event that has its final fulfillment in the return of Jesus Christ as he exalts himself by restoring creation, finalizing our salvation, and judging unbelievers. And so we look at all these scriptures to help understand this definition and derive our, our definition from these scriptures. Okay, Again, to give us a proper understanding of this doctrine. Again, too many people only view it as an end time thing where God judges the wicked, but we see that it's not just a one time thing end time event. It is a multiple fulfillment. It is a joyful day for some because salvation will come. It is a time of rest, a time of blessing. That is what this day brings. But for others, it will be a horrific day. 
So this day involves not just restoration and salvation, but destruction and judgment, both. And that's why we gave that definition, okay? And then we also took just a little bit of time to show you how the day of the Lord, and this was really exciting for me. I don't know if it was for you, but it was for me, to see how the day of the Lord was foreshadowed or typified in the Sabbath day and even in the promised land. And it even has its seed origins in the book of Genesis this day. And, and we walked you a little bit through Hebrews to help you see how the author of Hebrews connects the Sabbath day, the Sabbath land, and the Sabbath eternity, or that day. Okay? If you didn't hear last week's sermon, well, I know that there's no internet going on right now in the high desert. Um, at least there wasn't a little while ago, but you can go back and listen to that a little while later. But hopefully this helped correct a lopsided understanding of what this day is about. Now, with this previous sermon of the day of the Lord in the past, we now have a better grasp of how that day is. We have a better understanding of it. And now we can look at Joel a little bit better. And so we should be asking questions. When Joel talks about this day, is it referring to past, present, or future events to come, or even the final one? We should be kind of trying to tear this apart and piece it together. Now, the central point of today's passage, it's not that just Judah should be concerned, but the nations or unbelievers should be terrified of the coming day of the Lord, not just Judah. In verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2, the passage that we read this morning, we have a literary structure called a chiasm. For those that don't know, a chiasm is a form of writing. It's a form of structure where the first statement is parallel to the last statement. And then the second statement is parallel to the second to the last statement. And the third statement is parallel to the third from the last statement until you arrive at a central point. And the, the author is trying to ascend into a high point and descend in order to draw attention to this focal point this morning. And so I want you to look at the diagram on the screen. If it's not already up there, it should be at this point. Um, you will see that A matches double A. And B matches double B, C matches double C, D, and double D, and then to the high point of E. And so in this passage, you ascend to a central focal point, and then you descend in a reverse pattern. That's what we have here today. And so uh, while I was studying this, this text, I had a little bit of free time on my hands this week at work, and I was looking at the passage. I saw what I thought were indicators of what could be a chiasm. And so I just took the scripture by itself and I printed it out twice on a, on a piece of paper and I took it to two guys at my work and both of them are members here at church. I took it to John who's running slides and I took it to Caden who likes to interrupt our worship service. <laughs> all right? He'll never do that again, I promise. Right? Right? Yes, all right, all right, right on. All right. So I'm um, just playing. I love him like a, a son. He's getting a whooping when he gets home, all right? So anyway, I gave him both this pa I gave him both a blank paper with the scripture on it, and I said, hey, guys, uh, tell me if you see a chiasm in there. I said, do you know what that is? And they're like, duh. And I was like, sorry, excuse me, Mr. Theologian's over here, right? So they knew what a chiastic structure was, and they came back and identified the same chiastic structure that I did. And so I knew it wasn't my imagination, and so we didn't have any scholars or fancy uh, theological books to inform us. It was just this beautiful little Easter egg, this beautiful little treasure, this beautiful little gem that we found tucked away in this uh, 11 verses. And so the high point, the central point, the focal point is that we must fear the day of the Lord. And I'll show you how this is laid out in chiastic form because, again, we're dealing with poetry here. The first point we see, number one, which parallels with verse 11, we see a day of declaration, a day of declaration. In regards to this chiastic structure, we see that verse 11, uh, 1 and verse 11 coincide. This is a day of declaration, a day of announcement. We see two different announcements, two different sorts regarding this day of the Lord. One is in verse 1 and the other is in verse 11. In verse 1, we see that a ram's horn is to be sounded. A trumpet blast is to announce that danger is coming to who? If you read the text, it's to Judah, okay? This horn was to be blown in Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem, all right? That's the capital city of Judah. And this horn signals that war is coming and invasion is coming. It serves to alert the citizens that the town is in danger, something is coming. In Springfield, Missouri, where I went to college, 
I don't advise living in Springfield, Missouri, but that's where I went to college. We had tornado warnings and sirens that would alert the town that danger was coming. When we heard these, we knew that it was time to get below ground in a basement. It is an ominous sound. I I thought another country was invading us the first time I heard it. I'm like, how did they get that far? We're in the middle of the country. (laughs) What is that? Tornado's coming. Unless you want to get stabbed with a piece of straw flying through the air, you better get down below. It was scary. You remember those, honey? David, I know you were there. Those are the worst noises ever, man. You're just expecting bombs to get dropped on you, right? You get, it is an ominous sound. That is what this horn sounding in Jerusalem is meant to do. Strike fear into you. Strike terror into you. That is a ram's horn. It alerts of what is to come. And so just remember last week, Joel talked about the day of the Lord, and then he referred to the past. Now when Joel talks about the day of the Lord, he uses cues and hints that lets us know. Now he's talking about the future. He's not referring to past stuff, but what is to come. Danger is coming. Hasn't happened yet. So we see this language shift. The first mention of the day of the Lord looks backwards. The second day of the mention of the day of the Lord now looks forward. But they're connected. It is coming and it is near because it has come and is upon them. And we're actually moving into an escalation of the day of the Lord, an intensifying of it, if you will. Okay? So one backward look, one forward look. It's not here in fullness. Worse is yet to come. So all the inhabitants of the land should tremble, referring to uh, the Israelites, right, those who are in Judah. All of them should tremble. And this phrase, inhabitants of the land, it is used regularly in Scripture, but in Joel as well. Inhabitants of the land. Not owners of the land, inhabitants of the land. It's a constant reminder to them that this land was a gift from God to them. This was God's land, and he gave it to them. Just like creation is God's, it all belongs to him. Not just the cattle on a thousand hills, but God owns everything. There's nothing in this universe that doesn't belong to God. And so they are there because God allowed them to be there. And this land, again, it was supposed to be a blessed land, a land of rest, reminding them that God saved them from wicked Egypt. But now the land is cursed. It is not blessed. Just like Egypt was cursed and God brought judgment upon them. And so this cursing of the land should remind them, gosh, this feels a little eerie. This feels like what God did to Egypt. Yes, you're in the same boat as Egypt right now. You are, you are rebelling against God and you are under judgment. They're acting like pagan nations. And so verse 1 shows a horn being blown to signal Judah to prepare for war upon them and destruction. God is coming to war against them. In verse 11, we see the parallel. It's not a horn that is heard, but it's what? It's God's voice. And it's a signal, not to Judah, but to God's army. It's a signal that it's time for this army to rise up and wage war on Israel. So do you see the parallel? Two noises being made, one horn, one God's voice. Two people being alerted. One's Judah, one's God's army. One's going to get attacked, one is to go and attack. That's the parallel that's going on here. Okay? So we see that. And they are to carry out the command of the Lord, this powerful army. Its power comes from God, which is why no one can endure this day. This event is terrible and dreadful. And so it's not an event to look forward to when you are at war with God. Please hear that. It is not something to look forward to. Meeting God face to face should not be a happy moment if God is coming to wage war against you because of your rebellion towards him. You will not say, hey, God, that's just the way it is. It's how it was. You you will not be able to stand like that before God like some punk in a courtroom defying the judge. You won't be able to. So hopefully you see this parallel, okay, between the horn and God's voice Warning Judah, the voice of God arousing this enemy. It is a terrible day, and it is connected to the day of the Lord, which is mentioned in both of these verses. Both of these verses mention the day of the Lord. Those are the bookends, if you will, letter A and double A of this ascending staircase, okay? As we mentioned last week, this day is not a one-time event. 
not a one-time, end-time event. It happens on multiple occasions, with the final event coming when Christ comes again to make war against a world of unbelievers. And Revelation tells us this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we are told that when Christ comes, he will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. Do you see that day of the Lord? And how this day of the Lord points forward to that. And that's why we sang songs like, How Great Thou Art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation. It is, it is referring to this day of the Lord, is it not? Can you see that, right? How these songs, you're like, I didn't know How Great Thou Art was partly about the day of the Lord. It's there. When every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Ancient of days, okay? All these songs that we talked, sang this morning were about this day. Now, there's this major announcement that judgment is here for unbelievers, but that announcement will also be good news for those who are saved and in Christ. Victory is coming, and God is our victorious warrior. As we ascend the chiastic structure, we see that this day that is declared, right? It's a day of declaration, but it's also a day of darkness, a day of darkness, Verse 2 parallels to verse 10. Look at the similarity. In verse 2, we see darkness and gloom, a cloud and total darkness. What do we see in verse 10? We see that the sun and the moon grow dark and stars cease their shining, that this is not a sunny day. This is poetic language and imagery meant to arouse a sense of dread. It's it's like the nothing in the ever never-ending story. Do you guys have you ever seen that movie? No? Am I the only one? The never-ending story? Yes, I got a thumbs up. That's a wonderful movie. A wonderful uh, fantasy-type movie. All right, I I love it. Anyway, we watched it last week. That's why it's so fresh in my mind. But there's this ominous nothing coming in, eating up everything. There's some play on what's going on there. You have to watch it to figure it out. All right? But here's the thing. This is a day of darkness, a day of dread. Do you see the parallel in verse 2 and 10, just like you do 1 and 11, right? Recall with me the creation account in Genesis. Now, I want you to to pay attention to when I preach. I never use the word story, the creation story. You know why? Because it sounds like it's not real. I always say account, all right? The telling of or the account. I want just something I want you to pay attention to. When you are talking about Old Testament stories... Make sure you use, I think you should use the word account because it's history, all right? We're not telling fables and stories. But recall with me the account of creation in Genesis 1. On day three, we see God creating vegetation and fruit, okay? You can go back and revisit that. On day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. We remember that. After that, God created man and woman in his image on day six. Then we see, after God created the planet, Vegetation, sun, moon, and stars, and everything else. I'm I'm highlighting those two things for a reason. Vegetation and the celestial lights. After God created man and woman, he blessed them. He blessed them. You, You may not have made that connection, but it's important that you get it. He blessed them. They were the pinnacle of the creation of God. God created this world for them to inhabit it. They are inhabitants of the land, just like Israel is of the promised land. God blessed them in the land with the land. That, that, it wasn't just a pronounced blessing. It was tangible blessing. I got food. I got a beautiful garden. I got a beautiful wife. I got a, a handsome husband. And we got all this creation. And we got God. We are blessed. God has blessed us. Okay? That was God's intent. What an awesome God. Everything in creation was meant to bless them with the knowledge of God because creation reveals all the knowledge of God and declares his glory. Creation reveals God, and that was part of God's blessing to them. So just remember that creation account. When we now hear the language of Joel, of darkness and gloom, clouds, total darkness, the sky shaking, the sun and the moon, and the stars ceasing to shine, What is being removed? If if God gave creation to bless Adam and Eve and humanity, what do you think this language is conveying to us when God darkens all these things and removes vegetation and food from them? It's showing us through creative language that God's curse is upon them. Are you tracking with me? 
I, I hope you are. I hope that makes sense and I didn't confuse it. If the creating of these things was for the benefit and blessing of mankind, then when we see the removal of these things in poetic language, we should think decreation, not creation. Destruction, not creation. Curses, not blessing. This is decreation language, the opposite of Genesis language. Again, Adam, Adam was a son of God, placed in a garden. Israel is a new son of God, and he's placed in Israel is in this promised land, which was meant to be like a new Eden for Israel. And just like God curses the land and the garden after Adam and Eve sinned, so God curses the promised land when Israel turns away from God. We have a, just a, a repeat of a story just happening over and over and over again. Okay, It's meant to tell us our folly and show us our need for a Savior. Now, as a reminder, Jesus... Not just Adam was a son of God, not just Israel, but we have the perfect son of God, Jesus, who leads us into a new garden, a new creation, the eternal land of rest, okay, where we are blessed forevermore. Indeed, this is what God was doing by destroying their harvest and vegetation, showing curses upon them. He's removing blessing, bringing on his curses, decreating. Now, as you read the text, you see that God's powerful army is mentioned, this great and strong people that appear. Some people think that it refers to a further infestation of locusts, okay? And you can go back and track the language from chapter 1 to see that. Some people believe that this refers to an actual army like the Assyrians or the Babylonians. For now, let's just remember that the end result is the same regardless of which view you take, okay? God's destruction is coming, this invasion is coming, it says, like dawn spreading over the mountains. Like dawn spreading over the mountains. Just get that imagery of when the sun is rising in the morning and light is spreading. Now, it's interesting because Joel just used a darkness metaphor, right? Darkness and the stars ceasing to shine and the sun and the moon and all that being blacked out, okay? Um, he's now using a light metaphor to indicate God's judgment, all right? A light metaphor. He just goes from darkness to light. Now, Joel's not schizophrenic, okay? He's not trying to say that these things are, uh, darkness and light are the same thing. But what he's saying is that he's using different images to convey the same thing. So what happens when dawn arises? The sun slowly spreads out. You see its first rays. And then what was dark becomes light. And as the sun rises more, it just begins to spread and spread, Right? That's what's going on. And that's how God, uh, through Joel, is describing this army, that it's coming. Right? He's, he's using the light metaphor to say it's coming. And you're going to be soon engulfed in the entire thing. Destruction is coming up across your whole land. That's what he's using, the light metaphor. Okay? So we might put it like this. The army is coming. And as the infantry continues to arrive, it will get worse and worse. In fact, all of Judah's past history and future history, all right, the scripture says the size of this army will be unmatched, which is how God refers to the locusts in chapter 1, which is why some people take that view. But some people, again, think it refers to uh, an invading actual army, all right? But this is why the earth and the skies shake, because of this judgment of God coming upon them. And if you're paying attention, if you're paying attention, the language of, of locusts the language of locusts is still governing this description of the day of the Lord. The language of locusts and how they interact is still governing this passage, okay? Locusts, what do they do? When they arrive, they're innumerable, okay? They are darkening the sky with their billions in number, okay? And when they arrive, all right, they just seem like a small blip on the radar from afar, like the sun just creeping over the mountain. But as they approach, it gets darker and darker, more and more devastation. And so Joel is using the language of locusts to show curses, decreation, and judgment that is coming from God. And it could be another wave of locusts, because later talks about, uh, Joel talks about God would restore the years that the swarmer and the, and the locusts took away from them. So it could be multiple waves, but it could be an Assyrian army or a Babylonian army. <clears throat> it's hard to tell, 
I can tell you that his opinions are split all over, and every, every commentary that I read, they're like, it can't be that. It's not the locusts. It's the army. And then the other guy's like, no, that guy's wrong. It's not the army. It's the locusts. He's wrong. And they're just back and forth, back and forth. I'm like, you both are dumb. I have no idea who's right, but I have tell you, I have waffled back and forth, and um, I don't know. But what I do know is that the end result is the same. Total destruction. It is a day of darkness. You don't want to be there. Judah, okay? But it doesn't change the effect. The announced day is a dark day, a cursed day for those who rebel against God. Similar language is used in the book of Revelation to signal the gloom and doom of God's judgment, the darkening of the celestial bodies. In fact, when Jesus comes again on the final day, on the day of the Lord, that final one, on the day of judgment, his judgment will be so thorough that sun and moon and stars will actually be done away with. Scripture says we will have no need for these things on that day when he comes. Why? Because in a marvelous display of God's grace, in a marvelous display of God's blessing, in the new creation, in the new heaven on earth, instead of giving us stars, moon, and sun to be our light to bless us, God says, I will be your light. And so rather than having celestial bodies to shine light upon us, God's very presence will light us up. That's a greater blessing than the blessing that we have now. And the blessing that we have with the celestial bodies shining on us is just meant to point forward to the day when God is our light, okay? God himself is the greater, bigger, and fulfillment of what these temporary things do for us. He is our blessing. As we ascend the chiasm a little further, Step three, we see that it is not just a day of darkness. It is not just a declared day. Thirdly, we see it as a day of total devastation. Look how verse three and verse nine parallel. Notice that this army has a scorched earth policy. Before them and behind them, fire is raging. The army is consuming everything around them. That's the gist of this phrase. But but then we see that Joel uses language from Genesis 1. 1 through 2, okay? Genesis 1 and 2, I should say. He mentions, now listen to this. He mentions that the land that is being cursed is like the Garden of Eden. And so it's not my imagination to say that the promised land was to be like a Garden of Eden. Joel knew that, all right? And so part of it has not been destroyed yet. There's more devastation coming. Again, this signals to us that creation is meant to be a blessing to us, but sin ruins it via God's judgment. The promised land was to be a new Eden for Israel, a new garden of blessing, a new land. But we see that as the army invades the land, that it's consuming all that is good, it's leaving a desert wasteland behind them, the land of blessing is now becoming a land of desolation, total devastation, God decreating and removing their blessing, just like God cursed the ground and removed blessing from Adam and Eve in the garden. So God is removing blessing from this land. The point of verse 3 is that there is no escaping the full judgment of God. There is no escaping the full judgment of God. And this parallels with verse 9 in the chiastic structure. A different, <clears throat> a different analogy <clears throat> is used to describe the destruction that the army brings to Judah in verse 9. They are said to storm the city. They run the walls. They climb into houses. Again, this is locust-like behavior, and it's used to indicate that that which is coming cannot be stopped. That's what it's telling us, okay? And this is why verse 3 parallels verse, uh, verse 9. The blessings of God are being stripped. If you've ever had anything stolen from your home, it's not a fun feeling, okay? This army that is coming is likened to thieves. What does fire do? Destroys everything. When the thief breaks in, what are they trying to get? Everything that matters to you that is of value. And so verse 3 and verse 9 are using two different images. Destruction of fire, the thievery. In both cases, What matters and that you need most is gone. 
And you can't stop it. That, that's the point of these verses. I and mean, if you've ever had your home broken in, you feel vulnerable, you feel taken advantage of, you can't get back what was taken from you, that's the imagery that fire and thievery are meant to portray. So never forget that the day of the Lord was, was real, but it points to a final day of the Lord. So let me just say that if you're not a believer in Christ, if you're not one that has called upon Christ to save you, If you don't trust him to save you from this day, it will be a day in which all good things, listen, please listen, that day will be a day in which all good things that God has ever allowed you to touch and to taste and to see and to hear and to smell and to enjoy, all of those will be stripped from you. God's blessings were meant to draw you near to him. And to cause you to flee to him as one who loves you. And if you have turned your back on him, in spite of him, and loved these things more than him, and not served him, and served these things rather than the one who gave them to you, they will be stripped away. They will not last forever. A day is coming when you will see God's fury face to face, and you will be stripped of all the goodness that he has sent your way. And you will not be able to escape the fullness of that day. That is what Joel chapter 2 verse 3 says. And verse 9 are trying to communicate to Judah, and that's what it communicates to us on this final day. The prophet's warning of Judah to Judah should serve as a warning to us, his warnings. So do not let your heart be callous. If you are not a believer, do not harden your heart towards God. Heed his word. He's given it to humanity to help us know what is coming, to show us that Christ can save us from that day of destruction, and that that day of destruction can be a final day of blessing instead. Okay? We will... We will, you know, this boggles my mind. We will watch rescue movies all day where people are rescued from danger by a hero. But when presented with the ultimate rescuer story and we are seen as those in danger, we, are, we spit on that message. We spit on it and despise it when we become the ones who need rescue and help. And God is the one who can rescue us. We will watch all kinds of movies that portray superheroes that rescue people. This story, sinners hate it. It just shows what the problem is. The problem is with God. The problem is with they don't want to see themselves as God tells them to see themselves. We are too hateful of God to see how good he is. And that is why God must change our heart. We can be so self-deceived, blinded by Satan, that we can't see the good news for what it is. Right? Our nature is corrupt and we are torpid. We are not alert. We are unaware that danger is coming until God takes off the blinders and shows us what is coming. This is a day of gloom that will usher in an eternity of anguish for you if you are not a Christian. So flee to Christ. Run to him. It is total devastation. So this declared day, this dark day, this devastating day, it is also a day of discord. Let's ascend a final, uh, uh, one more step before the final step, a day of discord. It's important that we see this day not just as a bad event, not just as a natural disaster, as if destruction like this is happening to Judah because, well, now is just a bad time. It must be seen as a day of discord with God, a day of discord. This is a day that God comes to battle and bring judgment upon Judah. This is a day of discord. It's not, just, it's not just the locust invasion or the drought. This is God stepping up and standing toe-to-toe with Judah and demolishing them where they are right now. These are, this, whether it's an actual army and, and the locusts in the first part or locusts and locusts, it's God doing this. This is the day of discord with God, a fight between two parties. Notice that the language of verses 4 and 5 matches the language language of 7 and 8 in our parallel, uh, in our chiasm this morning. Verses 4 and 5 parallel verses 7 and 8. In verses 4 and 5, we're presented with images of war and weapons and war and warriors. This army looks like horses. This army gallops like horses. And this use of like is, is one reason why some people think that this is not an actual army, but a further invasion of locusts because uh, it's using the word like. Like, why would you say that an army is like an army unless it was an army, okay? So this, if the army is actually locusts, 
then it would make sense to say that the locusts are like horses and they gallop like horses, that they bound on mountaintops. They actually make noises like that of chariots or there's noise in their buzzing and crackling noises like fire burning up things. I, I've been told that that's what locusts sound like, at least through the reading of historical materials. Okay, um, They are my, like a mighty army sent off to war. Now, those that hold to a literal army view I'm presenting just a little bit of information to show you why some, some people take this view, okay? Those who hold to a little army view would say that, well, if you read Deuteronomy 28, you see that God's curses go from locusts then to army invasion, all right, as the curses escalate. And so there's argument on that side, okay? And so there's more to this debate, but again, this is imagery, this is poetry. It's meant to arouse your fear, arouse your uh, rouse you from slumber to get you to see what God is doing in order to take action. And so the imagery is secondary to the truth that is being presented behind it, okay? The imagery does matter, but ultimately the truth is total devastation is coming from God. You better wake up. You better repent. And if you can get that, then you can then have these finer debates a little bit later and work it out yourself, all right? So the truth revealed is judgment is coming. Feel sorrow. Judah, feel shame. Be filled with dread. Then turn from your sin and be blessed. You don't have to be cursed, Judah. Whether, again, it's more locusts or a real army, God can save you and restore you. He can restore the land, which is what God is getting at in a coming portion of Scripture. Freshness, newness of life, Judah, can be yours in God's love. But you got to stop hating God. Stop warring against him. If you pick a fight with God, you will be destroyed. Repent. As you look at verses 7 and 8, you see the mirror of this language from verses 4 through 5. The army attacks as warriors. They scale walls like warriors do. They have their marching orders and they each stay on their path of their assignment given to them. They march in rank and file, and they're able to evade weapons that are fashioned against God. They're unstoppable, this army is. Again, this army is God's army, and he can use locusts. He can use evil nations like the Assyrians or the Babylonians if he chooses to bring judgment upon Judah. But lest you think God is okay with wicked nations, just know that wicked nations will be judged as well. And we'll get to that part in Joel soon enough. This brings us then, as we see this day of discord, that it is actually war between God and sinful humanity for their rebellion against him. We get to the final point or the high point of our chiasm. This poetic structure is meant to get us to focus on this one point that we're hitting right now. This announced day, this devastating day, this dark day, this day of discord is a day from God. Therefore, it is a day to dread. A day to dread. Verse 6 is what Joel wants us to focus on. The nations writhe in horror before this army of God. All faces turn pale. They glow. Writhe means to twist when you're in pain and in agony. To be in anguish. This is how the nations view the army of God. Again, whether locust or natural powerful nation, they're terrified and horrified at this people, at this devastating army. Everything that comes face to face with this army is scared to death. Everyone. They, they look like they saw a ghost when they see that it is coming near them. The fear is such that it looks like life has left their body. All faces turn pale. What do you think Judah's response should be, knowing that this is the focal point of Joel's message here in these verses? What should they do with this expanded knowledge of the day of the Lord and this invading army? They should be afraid. They should be horrified and terrified. They should wake up. They should repent. They should turn to God and seek salvation because they can't escape this dark day. And hopefully you can see how the text is ascending. The day is coming. It is dark. 
It is total devastation because it is war from God. You better be terrified. Do you see how that escalates? And then it descends in order to drive home that point. If you are not scared of this day and you are warring against God, then you don't understand how bad this day is. You are foolish. The prophet warns that we might find salvation, that we might find rescue. And again, these days, they point towards the final day. They're repeated days in history to let us know that judgment is coming. The first day, it happened when God told Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat, you will surely die. And they were judged that day. And then God in his kindness showed how the Sabbath, the Sabbath rest could point to a day when we would have a rest from our struggles and our labors in this world, pointing towards that final day of blessing, that day of the Lord. And then it just expands and we see, oh my gosh, it happened in Noah's day. God brought judgment upon the world. And then Peter tells us, huh, Jesus is coming again. How do, you remember that day when God judged the world by a flood? Well, the day of the Lord, it's going to be by fire, which lets us know that the flood was the day of the Lord. And we see it in Egypt when God delivered them. And then we see it in Israel over and over again. And then we see God judging uh, Judah. And then we see God judging the Syrians and the Babylonians. And it, it just, these days are pointing to the final one. Wake up, wake up, world. That's the whole point of what God is trying to do. Psalm 9 says, rise up, Lord. Do not let mere humans prevail. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Put terror in them. Put terror in them, Lord. Let the nations know that they are only humans. That's what Psalm 9 tells us. Put terror in them. There's a day coming when the world will wish they had heeded the warning of God in Joel, in Revelation, in the Gospels, in Genesis, all throughout Scripture, this warning is shown to us. If you are a Christian, I thank God, and I praise God, and I know you do too, that God has alerted you to this day and shown you the reality of it so that you could flee to Christ, who was judged for you on the cross. And that is how we can be spared this day. That day is a day of judgment. So you must know that the day Christ died on the cross and God unleashed his fury on Jesus, he was suffering the wrath of the day of the Lord on that day. And so in some measure it can be said that Jesus suffered the day of the Lord that sinners should suffer. But only those who trust in Christ. Only those who trust in Christ. You wonder why the stars grew dark and the sun ceased its shining on the, on the moment Jesus died? There was the day of the Lord happening so that we would not have to experience it, its judgment, but so that we could experience its blessing. And church, for that reason, we should be fully devoted to Christ. You know, we're not one of those churches that does altar calls and has people come up here and pray with a counselor or anything. What we do is we admonish you and tell you right where you are, you get right with God. If, if, if you are not a Christian, you need to believe that Jesus died so that you would not have to die. That he rose so that you could have life everlasting. That blessing that the day of the Lord will bring. Because if not, you will be terrified and horrified on that day. And if you are a Christian who has believed that message, can, can I just, uh, I don't know what, what the right word is. Can I just, uh, can I invite you or remind you? of what kind of commitment you should have to this God who has saved you and removed that horror from you? If you've been slacking your walk with God, it's time to re-up that commitment and say, hey, I, I'm not going to be slack in my love for the Lord. I have, no, I have nothing to fear because of him. He's removed that terror from me. I will be devoted to my God because that's what God is calling Judah to do, to live in faithfulness to him. And that's why they're getting judged because they're not. So renew your Love for God. Cast off the sin that besets you and slows down your race for God. There's a cloud of witnesses watching. The Lord is watching. Run with faithfulness. Run with endurance that race that is set before you. Be like Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross, he just set his face and said, I'm going to go do what God wants me to do. And you follow your Lord. You follow your Lord. You follow your Savior in that same type of commitment. Lord, I'm yours. You bought me with a price. I serve you. 
As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Just renew your commitment to God. Renew your devotion. Stop being slack. But sinner, if you are not in Christ, come to him today. I don't know when that day will come. I don't, I don't know which part of the sky the world will be the first to see him. But when he descends, it's too late. It is too late when he begins to descend upon this world. And for those of us that know he's coming, we can rejoice. The trumpet has been sounded. Our salvation is getting finalized in that moment. So let us worship him now. Let us come to him now with gratitude. And as we take communion in just a second, um, may we do so with a heart of worship with this day in mind. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we exalt you as the one who is coming to judge and to save. You are sending your son to rule this world. We will see you face to face. We will dwell with you forever on that day, even as that day has already begun. Lord, we've already entered our rest in Christ, but we long for its fullness. But Lord, we pray for those who are apart from Christ, who reject him as Savior, who war against him with their rebellion and sin. Lord, may they be put on notice today that there is a day to be terrified of. That like the nations of the world, Lord, who feared God's judgment, all people, all places, should fear the wrath of God. And that should drive us, God, to Jesus for salvation. So I pray that that would be the case today for those who don't know Christ. And for those of us who are saved, may we be reminded of what we have been saved from. May we continue to be devoted to you and worship you with all that we have and all that we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare to receive communion, the, the ushers will help pass out the elements. Now, again, this is only for believers. And the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, Scripture says, by his wounds we are healed, right? That he was beaten and torn for us. And that visually helps us to understand as the wrath of man was being poured out on Jesus, right, through the Romans and through the Jews who uh, wanted him executed, ultimately what was happening was Christ was being punished for us, and we see the wrath of God being poured out on Christ. And so when we take communion, the broken bread, and we take the, the, the juice, the fruit of the vine, we are reminded that the Lord suffered God's wrath for us. That's what the day of the Lord is bringing to unbelievers. And so never disconnect communion from the day of the Lord. Indeed, through taking of communion, we proclaim his death when? Until he comes what? Until he comes again. That is the day of the Lord. And so communion is connected to virtually every part of Scripture because Jesus' death and resurrection are proclaimed in Scripture through communion. And, and the apostle tells us that if Christ is not raised, then his preaching is in vain. And when they preach, they preach through all kinds of different stuff in the scripture. And therefore, we can know that it was all connected to Christ. All right? And so, communion is about Christ and his death and resurrection. And uh, so, we bless the Lord as we take this. We're reminded of his gift to us of salvation and that we are rescued from the day of the Lord. So, again, this is only for believers. If you're not a believer, please allow the elements, uh, the bread and the juice to pass by you. And uh, we will take communion together in just a second. Okay? But if you are a follower of Christ... You confess that Jesus is crucified, buried, risen again, and you've been baptized to show your, your, uh, your newness of life and your devotion to him as his disciple, then please partake with us if you're not under church discipline, all right? And we will sing uh, a song we just sang a little while ago, Did You Feel the Mountains Tremble? So ushers, if you'll help out with the elements, thank you. God can 
coming again, church, and we have to look forward to that. What a blessed day that will be. What a blessed thing we get to do every week as we take communion, that we are heralding the, the return of the Lord, the one who was crucified, buried, and risen again, and uh, that's precisely what we do. So, Make sure that you are in the habit of being present for the Lord's Day so that you can regularly partake of communion and, and be reminded of such uh, the wonderful measures of God's grace displayed to us. And um, <clears throat> First Corinthians 11, we have the Apostles Paul's instructions once again. He says in verse 23, For I have received... From the Lord, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, when he was betrayed, he, uh, betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together, church. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the cup. The gospel in picture. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. For us, church, when he comes again... That will be a day of blessing for those who aren't in Christ, who aren't privileged to partake of this gospel picture. They should fear that day. Brother Carlos, if you'll come and close us in our prayer and uh, in benediction. Thank you, brother. Let's pray. Holy Father, <clears throat> we thank you for just enabling us to be here today to hear this message. Lord, help us learn from Adam's failure and from Israel's failures. You are a just and holy God and who cannot look upon sin with comfort. You hate sin, Lord. You made us for yourself. You bought your church with the blood of your beloved son. Let us not believe in cheap grace where we think that we can continue to live in sin, all the while having safety insurance and that get out of jail card, Lord. May we not make excuses and hold on to our secret sins like Gollum holds on to his precious little ring. May your people seek after your face and experience the joy of the Lord. You judged Adam and sent him out of the garden. Israel went after idols and you brought your rod against them via the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans. And you did not leave one stone left on another when you destroyed the temple. O oh Lord, you judge in righteousness, for the day of the Lord has come, is coming, and will come. And you will judge our sins lest we repent. But you have told us that blessed are we when we obey and adore you alone. And blessed is the nation whose God is you, the Lord Almighty. May we take your gospel message to the nations. May we obey everything you've commanded us to do. And may all the nations come under your authority and do everything that you've commanded them to do. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For our benediction, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 21. And it reads like this. Now may the God of peace who brought... Again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equipped you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You may go in peace.